Hi guys, it's Phil here. Uh, welcome to this live seminar on dealing with triggers. And uh, here we are, Thursday, 5.30 in the UK. If you're watching it now, welcome. If you are watching and you want to ask any questions, pop them down on our uh, comments section and uh, that would really be really helpful. I've got a few things I want to talk about today on the, uh, the triggers seminar, but if you have any specific questions, that would be brilliant. Just pop them down at the bottom. So uh, once again, uh, it's raining outside, which means the Wi-Fi is a bit weak, uh, which is a trigger for me to get annoyed <laughs> about uh, technology in 2016. Uh, but hopefully it's good enough and you can understand and hear what I'm saying. So I'm Phil. I'm an expert in the psychology of health, happiness and genius. If you've been watching these seminars, these free seminars, I've been covering loads of stuff. And one of the things that uh, uh, when I ask people, what do you want me to talk about next? A number of things came about triggers and anchors and they're kind of similar things so <clears throat> let's begin what are triggers well trigger is when something happens and suddenly you find yourself in a really crappy state so that could be any state it could be rageful uh, being cut up in traffic where somebody <clears throat> does something that you think is unreasonable and suddenly you find yourself with this massive change in your physiology <clears throat> it could be uh, Hi, David. I can't see your comments. Not showing up on my brilliant feed, unfortunately. Um, let me see. Oh, there I can see it. Brilliant. <clears throat> um, so that's a trigger uh, when someone cuts you up in traffic. Uh, a couple of triggers for me are uh, my mum. <laughs> when I'm around my mum, I suddenly start being like a really grumpy teenager. It's it's fascinating for other people to watch. There's a feel that brilliant author about self help, and there I'm going. Uh, so family members can do it, uh, or people that we have old connections and relationships with can do it. <clears throat> Another thing for me is when I work with the NHS, they they want me they always want to send client details by fax or by mail by post because they say email is dangerous, and I'm like ah. How can an email be more dangerous than somebody posting something in a letterbox that gets lost a million times a day? Um, what else does it for me? Oh, people people lose, leaving parcels. You know, there's people who go, oh, we called and you were out. And you've been sitting there looking outside the window all day and nobody's called. Those are triggers. And what's interesting when we get triggered in those kind of situations, we get into a crappy state that isn't useful. And we say they made it happen to us. So this is an example from my life. <clears throat> From your lives, where, what triggers you? If you pop them down on the comments, I'm, I've got a computer here that should show me your comments uh, so I'll be able to see them hopefully. Uh, <coughs> what what, what gets you? I talked about uh, being rageful, or being angry or, or being annoyed, but also we can get triggered into stress. Things can make us suddenly feel anxious. Notice this language, make us something makes us feel this way. I want to catch these sentences we'll talk about why in a minute but just start to notice some of the conversations you have in your head as you feel these sensations these triggers sometimes we can be triggered into guilt doing things we didn't really want to do in order to make someone happy so here we've got two made we got uh, I made myself do this thing to make somebody else happy so let's have a look at this phrase the make me the people not dropping off the parcel when they swore blind they did and they knocked on the door and they didn't makes me annoyed. This little phrase makes me or I don't know, I just felt that way. They did this thing. I just felt this feeling. It triggered the feeling in me. In these statements, if you've done the lightning process or you've read my book, The Do or The Get the Life You Love, you should notice these are great examples of being passive where we're saying something external to us, not us is causing these feelings inside us. And the problem with this statement, which we hear all the time, is if the problem, the feelings we're having, are caused by something external to us, then, well, most of us have tried at some point to change things, change other people, get people to be different. Don't do that. Please don't ever do that again. Don't say things that way. It doesn't really work, does it? We've all tried it. We've all tried to get people to be nicer, uh, cleaner, tidy up after themselves, be more punctual. Generally, they don't. Hi, guys, it's Phil again. I've gone on to a cellular phone signal, see if that's better than the brilliant Wi Fi. Thanks, Sky. Um, so, yeah, back again. I was talking about how we get into a state where 
we talk as though this thing has occurred and it makes us feel a certain way. And there's a massive problem with this. <clears throat> when we say this makes us feel, it means that the only way we can resolve this is we have to go and sort this external thing out, which we said is pretty tricky. It's quite difficult to change people's behaviours. As I say, we've all tried it. It doesn't tend to work. This is why I invented this word, the do, D-U, with a little circumflex on the top of the U. <clears throat> In order for us to distinguish that actually, although it really feels like it, these people, these things are not triggering us. They're not making us feel that way. They're giving us an invitation to come and do that and join in with this feeling, but they cannot make us feel anything. And this is a, a really important statement. It sounds a bit contradictory because our genuine experience is people make us feel certain ways. The way he looked at me made me feel this way. When she said I was fat, that made me feel this way. That sounds a completely reasonable thing to say. However, it's not completely true because although they said that thing, there is a gap between what they say and whether we decide to buy into it, to engage with it, and then feel the way. Because in fact, only us, only I, can make my feelings. Other people can help, certainly. They can encourage us in. They can say things that make us start to run with that idea. But fundamentally, if you choose not to engage with some other person's stuff or shit, then actually you can step away and decide not to be engaged. One of the, the good examples of this is if you've ever been on a, a bus in London, invariably you get stuck next to somebody who's got mental health issues at some point and they'll start to say things to you like, your hair is green or I don't like the colour of your skin or you know there are aliens in your handbag that I don't like. And they can be quite, you know, ferocious in this position and, and, and say unpleasant things like, I hate you, I hate you all, you're all after me. But because we recognise this person's got mental health issues, we kind of go, oh, well, you know, that's not true. It's just the way it is. That's just what they're saying. And it allows us to give us this distance and we can see that we're not dictated to by other people's, what they say, what they say to us, what, how they look at us unless we t decide to take it on. So that's the first thing. The whole idea of triggers is kind of wrong. It doesn't feel that way. It feels like they trigger us, but they don't trigger us. They, they uh, like, present us with an invitation. They open the door. But we are the ones that have to join in. We have to step in. So that's the first thing. Remember, triggers don't actually exist. Although in my examples where I say, you know, I'm annoyed by the parcel guy, <clears throat> I really should say, I'm doing annoyed. I should recognise it's me that's the one that's getting annoyed. And if it's me that's getting annoyed, if you look at the guy pretending to deliver a parcel, I can't change that. I don't have any power. You know, he's not even here. He says he's here, but he's not outside the door. I can't affect that in any way. And so at that point, those emotions become really pointless and really useless. <clears throat> so watch out for these phrases. It made me. They triggered me. It just came on me. All that kind of stuff. Really great examples of passive. If you don't know what passives are, then either get the do book is available from the website or get the life you love yeah <clears throat> really important stuff there's also a website called doing.org which explains all this it's all free you can go and have a look at that stuff this brings us on to the next thing that people have asked me questions about is like okay well what happens when uh, people trigger you or as we would say you start to do certain feelings in, in response to how somebody's talked or behave what happens if you've got health issues if you've got health issues and you'll find that certain words act as triggers. So if you go to the doctor, the chances are they are going to talk about words that will have an effect on you. There's some great research on this where if they studied people, if you say the word pain, it actually triggers the neurology in your brain of pain. So at that point, yeah, you're kind of, uh, you don't really have any say over it. They're going to say what they're going to say. And it will create a little kind of vibration, a little trigger, a little signal in your nervous system. So sometimes people's behaviours will directly affect you. Then the question is, what do you do with that? How are you going to respond to that? Because if you let that run, that pathway run that they've invited you to get into, if you let that run, you're going to get into trouble. Because as we know, many people have studied my stuff around neuroplasticity, the more you use a pathway, the stronger it gets. So if you are ill and you have pathways that take you straight into a 
bad part of your brain that's all about illness. When you go to the doctor and they say a word that's related to your illness, you're going to zip into that. And the more you go into those pathways, the more those words allow you to think about those thoughts that aren't very useful for you, the stronger and more powerful those pathways become. So we can see that there's a kind of danger zone there. Uh, health issues, words, very important thing, but people, of course, are another great example of triggers. I'm starting to use my little air quotes here because, as you say, people do not trigger you. What happens is people do stuff and then we run with it. Yeah? We start to get, oh, they're doing it again. And we can notice it very clearly and that quite often we'll be running the stuff before they've even said anything. You know that thing where you go, I bet they're going to say that thing. They haven't even said it yet and we're completely immersed in the crappy neurology that's going to take us in the wrong place or where before we go and meet them we knock on the door we take a deep breath get myself ready well what are you getting yourself ready for you're getting yourself ready for conflict you're getting yourself ready for a trigger so you're actually stepping into the wrong neurology right from the get-go so people don't trigger us although it really does feel that way they don't they do all sorts of behaviours, but we still have this gap between what they do and our response. And that is the bit that we need to utilise. The ability we have to decide, are we going to go and jump in and, and swim in the same cesspit as they're in or not? <clears throat> so what else can I tell you about? Well, states. I've talked a lot about states, but I'm going to mention it here again. States are when we activate certain portions of an, our neurology. When we activate certain states like anxiety, rage, fear, uh, freezing, uh, feeling put upon, paranoia, whatever it is, those states are not useful states. We need to start deciding, are we in a great state Duh! or are we in some not so good state? And that could include just being flat, being bored, finding everything a bit tedious or really bad states where we feel anxious and stressed all the time. But distinguishing what state you're in is probably the most important thing you can do. You want to turn to yourself right now and ask yourself, okay, Phil, or whatever your name is, what state am I in? Uh, hopefully, as you're watching this, you'll be really intrigued. Or you might be going, oh, God, I hope he gets to the bit I really want to get to. In which case, you're in a different state from listening. You're in a state of slight anxiety. Right? Or I must write this down, but I'm going to forget it. You're now in a state of doubting whether you're going to recall these things and, and again, probably getting anxious. Or if you go, oh, I really don't like the way that picture isn't quite straight behind his head and the door's off to one side. You could be in a state of anxiousness or anxiety about that. <clears throat> so check in what state you're in because there's a million options you can be in. But one of the best questions you can ask yourself is, am I in the best state for the job at hand? And most of the time we're not. Triggers are a great example of this, where something happens and we jump into a very familiar often and not very useful state. But the good thing about realising that states exist and that we have power over our own states is it actually removes the importance of this other thing, this person from the equation. Because if they're not causing our state, then their behaviour is less relevant to us. Now, certainly, if you're hanging around someone who's just a pain in the ass the whole time, you know, that's probably going to get quite wearing. You're going to have to do quite a lot of state management. And this is a, another important question. It's like we can shift our state. We can recognize we're doing annoyed or doing fear around that person. <clears throat> but there may get to a point when you kind of think, you know what? Instead of having to regroup every time I'm around this person, maybe I need to reconsider is this a useful, sustainable, healthy, ecological relationship for me? Friendship, person to be in my life. Because there are some people that at this point in time, in their evolution and in your life, it's not a good place to be. And that's fine. The nature of friendships and stuff is that they change. Most of us, you know, we have some good, long-standing friends, but there's some people that we're great friends with, you know, back in the day when we're not anymore. You know, our lives are moved in a different direction, and that's fine. <clears throat> uh, friends, of course, are another brilliant uh, opportunity to get triggered. Choose your friends wisely, and then check it out and see if it still works for you. If you've got one of those friends where you're going, oh, God, I've got to go and see them, and uh, your partner goes, what? who are you going to see? And, and oh, yeah, it's my friend. That's not a great example of a friend. You really want someone that by being with them, it makes life easier, it makes life better. It's not a pain in the ass. It's not a chore. 
at that point, it's probably not a friendship anymore. So maybe check out some of those things. Now, if you're married to someone like this or related to someone like this, then there's a whole bunch of extra problems, of course, because there are some relationships, let's say you, you work in a, a, in a job and the person you work with, either a close colleague or your boss, is someone that you find difficult to get on with, you do difficulty around, then yeah, you, your ultimate goal may be to leave, but it often is the case that you can't do that today. You have to sit in the job for three months. So how do you manage yourself? Well, again, it's looking at your states. It's working out, well, what is the best way to deal with this situation that's less than perfect? And, and life is certainly full of that, isn't it? Now, not every person we ever meet is the best person to hang out with. So we're often shoved together with people we don't particularly get on with. They wouldn't be our best mate, you know, and that's fine. They don't have to be. But we need to find a way to be around them and not do stress, anger or worry. <clears throat> so I've got a little list of things here I want to talk about. Um, the next thing is, again, talking about people. Uh, somebody asked me a question about gaslighting. They say, OK, so uh, gas can, can you deal with gaslighting? So gaslighting, if you don't know, is someone intentionally tries to get you to doubt your own sanity or your own opinion or that anything you say is right. It's a really damaging way of being. Um, being around people like that does make you doubt yourself because if you constantly have this noise going, you know, I don't think you're quite straight. I think you're a bit wonky. I think you're a bit ill then naturally you would start to question your own judgment. And questioning your own judgment, it's not always a bad thing, but doing it endlessly is, is really quite damaging because it makes you start to not trust yourself. And one of the most important things to know is, you know, out of all the people who know you, you do know yourself better than anybody else. <clears throat> so if you find yourself in one of those kind of relationships where somebody's intentionally trying to cause you trouble, then you need to think about, okay, do I just extricate myself from this engagement or do I have enough skills to change my states around them? And sometimes the, the question is, is the answer is simple. It's like, no, this is not, this is not healthy and to move away to separate. But sometimes that's not always possible. <clears throat> the other thing to remember is that quite often when people have um, done you an injustice or slighted you or helped you to step into a crappy state, they didn't mean to. They really they had no idea and you know, they didn't they didn't intend to make you feel that way um, that wasn't their plan they didn't want to but that is what happened so the first thing probably to do when you find yourself triggered by someone else into a crappy state is just pause for a minute and kind of ask yourself right well, was that what they meant there's this interesting uh, conversation which is the whole idea of paranoia so paranoia is where you think everybody's against you well there's this interesting potential mental illness which is called pronoia doesn't really exist but it's an interesting concept which is you imagine that everybody is really well intentioned so when somebody cuts you up in traffic you probably thought well what they're probably trying to do is a get to their job faster and maybe they they swerved just to to make me slow down a bit because i was going a bit too fast and they really cared about me if you could really have that perspective of taking everything that everybody did in a positive light that may, 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 may like may make life a little bit easier. In uh, people who have an interest in reincarnation, uh, one of the viewpoints is uh, when people come back, they come back in uh, similar relationships. So uh, somebody was your mum in a past life, may come back as your daughter or your, your friend or something. And that these people are here to teach us lessons. That's at some point a kind of pro idea, this idea that actually everybody is there to try and help us along the, along the line in some way. <clears throat> um, so the first thing is check out their intention. Is, is there a positive intention? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Yeah. The next thing to do is, as I said before on other seminars, to be kind, to be kind to two people at least, to be kind to yourself and probably to be compassionate to them because if somebody's doing this kind of stuff to you, trying to manipulate you and to feel a certain way, then they are the ones with probably bigger problems than you. And you probably need to give them some compassion and some kindness. You know, as if almost you were dealing with someone with mental health issues. How would you treat them? Maybe a bit kinder. Doesn't mean you need to belittle them. It's just bringing a bit of compassion and kindness. <clears throat> Another thing I want to talk about is, is the dance. 
There's some lovely books um, called The Dance of Life and The Dance of Anger. Um, check them out. But the core theme in this is that uh, relationships are like a ballroom dance. So in ballroom dancing, uh, you have agreed steps. So if I'm the man, I will walk in a certain way. My feet will go in a certain position. If you're the lady, who's my partner, you will hold me in a different way. And your steps will kind of be the reverse of me. And so that our feet never actually tread on each other. And we get used to this dance. And the, the metaphor in these books is, if you imagine going to a dance class uh, and you're part of a troupe and you all do these dances and one day you go and you go, hey guys, we've got this brilliant new move. And you do these little dances and they go, that's lovely, Phil, but we're not doing that. We're doing, you know, these kind of dances. You go, yeah, but my new dance is great. You're like, yeah, great, but, but that's not the dances we're doing. We're doing the agreed dances. You know, we like this dance. And you go, oh, please. And they don't want to have the new dance. And you go, oh, come on, it's really good. And they go, no, stop. You're getting in our way now. You're actually causing trouble. And in the same way in relationships, we get used to certain ways of being. You do this and I do that. And even though it may not be comfortable, it's familiar. When you change things, the other person has to change, otherwise you start to step on their toes and their feet. And very often people don't like that. It's not like your new dance isn't better, it's just different. And they knew the steps of the old dance, they don't want to, have to learn a new one. And so very often when you produce something new, you bring something new into a relationship. So if you change how you're being around someone else, the relationship has to change because the relationship depends on how you two connect. But often when you make changes, the other person doesn't like it because it's not familiar. So they'll try and turn up the volume on their behaviors to try and push your buttons, to push your triggers even more. So they'll say stuff like, oh, you know, now you've done some self-development. You're so kind of selfish. You never give me any time. What they're actually trying to do is trying to manipulate you and to go back to how you were, where you used to do whatever they wanted. Or well, they'll say, oh, you're one of those people now who... Uh, who doesn't care about anybody else, you just care about yourself. Or uh, you're just, you're so hard-hearted, or whatever it is, they will, they will know, they know you well, they'll know what to say. So have a think about, it. what is the worst thing that somebody could say to me? You know, like you're just not a nice person. What is the worst thing that somebody could say? That's one of your trigger phrases, that if somebody really wants to get in and knock you over and make you crumple, and your resolve fail. Those are the statements they'll say. So anybody who's saying that to you, anybody who's saying those kind of conversations, the ones that really kind of cut you, they're probably people you need to have another look at and decide, is this someone that's healthy for me to be with? And if I have to be them with them, how do I find a way so that those comments are just comments, I don't let them in. If any of you guys are parents, you, you have this where kids say to you things like, I hate you. I never, ever liked you. And it's all because you didn't give them an ice cream, you know. It doesn't have any meaning. And hopefully in those moments, parents were able to go, yeah, whatever, you know, and not take it to heart. If you find yourself taking conversations like that to heart, you really need to ask yourself a few questions that so I've got written down here. First thing is to recognise when this is happening. To, you know, notice the familiar feelings. Feeling wobbly, feeling shaken up, feeling cut up, feeling distraught, feeling rageful, feeling guilty, feeling deeply sad or upset, whatever it may be. Notice that. That tells you something has kicked that off. Something they said that you've then interpreted and f decided at some level to feel this way because it is a decision. It doesn't feel that way. It feels like it's just something that happened. But it's your nervous system, so it is you that's responding in this way. Again, they've helped, but you're the one that's really run with the ball. Okay. Second thing is to make a different choice, to decide, to ask yourself these really, really important questions. Is what I'm feeling right now useful? They've done this thing, this event has occurred. The way I'm feeling now, is it useful? Such an important question. Second thing is to ask yourself, what is my wisest choice here? Now, if you ask yourself that, what's my wisest choice? That'll get really clear as to whether this is somebody you want to have in your life or somebody it's time to move away from. Or if they are in your life and you, you know there is no option, let's say you're, they're your mum or your son or whatever it is, or your boss. What is my wisest choice around this person? 
if you can make that choice, then actually what they're doing will be much easier to deal with because you'll kind of go, okay, they're doing that. My choice is to be this way. <clears throat> Another great question, which I've talked about before, is the 11th question of the 10 best questions in the world. Uh, there's a whole video on this uh, on, on my Facebook feed. Is what is really important here? So sometimes it can be, okay, well, I feel I ought to stay and listen or help this person out because I should. I've talked about shoulds before. But it makes me feel oh, horrible inside and I have to go and lie down for two days after because I feel so messed up by it. Or maybe what's really important is to take care of myself and say to this person, actually, I've got to go. I'm not doing this. And start to take care of yourself. Which brings us back to this core thing compassion, kindness for yourself. What is the kindest thing that you could do for yourself? And also, usually when you're doing the kindest thing for yourself, it's also increasing kindness for others. Because if you get stuck in these kind of relationships, these dances, not only can you not move on, they can't move on either. So you get two people's lives that are stuck. What is the kindest thing? And me and my guy who didn't deliver the parcel but said he did, the kindest thing, what's the wisest thing? Well, I can't change what happened. Can I be bothered to lose any more, you know, moments of my life being stuck in this crappy state? And we also know, of course, the more happy you are, the longer lifespan you get, the longer healthier lifespan you get. So the more stressed you are, the less life you have. So not only do you, do you use, lose the moments or minutes or hours or days or months or weeks or years of being stressed about something, it also cuts off more time at the end. So it costs you double. And you've got to ask yourself, is this worth it? And the answer is always, nope, it isn't. So if you have any questions, pop them down at the bottom. Nothing's showing up at the moment. That could just be the technology. Uh, but if you have questions, I can answer them in future seminars. So do pop them down there. I hope you found this useful. Main thing to know from this, to summarize, actually triggers don't exist. Nothing triggers us. We trigger ourselves. Things occur and then we decide to hook onto it and trigger our nervous system. But the trigger outside isn't what does it. It's us. It's our choice, our choice to run with that. And it's not a conscious choice. It's very important to say that. It's an unconscious choice. But as soon as we recognize that we're involved, we're doing that feeling, that response, it gives us the option to make change and make a choice by asking ourselves these really important questions. Is this useful? Is this the wisest choice? Is this kind to myself? Is this helpful? Is this really important? Is it worth putting my time and energy into this response? Now, starting to have these conversations will start to shift that instant. They appear, they do this thing, this thing happens, and I feel this way. It will start to give some space between the event and your response. And that will allow you to develop, again, through neuroplasticity, a deeper, better, healthier response to these kind of things. So I hope you found that useful, guys. I hope the signal's been okay. Great to see you. I'm off uh, next week to Poland and Finland, so I may or may not have a chance to do a uh, another seminar next week. We'll see how we get on. If I can, I will. If not, uh, please leave a message saying what else you'd like me to cover in these three seminars. I'll try and do one every Thursday when I'm in, in England. And thanks for joining. Leave a message, share it with your friends, and have a great weekend wherever you are. Bye now.